it makes me so happy to hear that and to know that we have you uh, creating opportunities for us. Um, and that well, being and can said, I tell you, can I tell you that I'm so grateful for the opportunities that you have been creating as well and opening the door. Because look at you now hosting your own show <laughs> on Logo, which is incredible. Logo Live fam, I am so excited to introduce you to my next guest, Stephen Canals, who's the co-creator and executive producer of the Golden Globe nominated show, Pose. He graduated from UCLA and got the MFA program where he started working on the pilot for Pose. He just signed a deal with 20th Century Fox. He is booked, he is busy, and guess what? He's here. Ladies, gentlemen, my queer fam, please welcome Stephen Canals. Stephen! <laughs> hey, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Welcome to Logo Live. Thank you for having me. Such a oh, pleasure cool. to see your beautiful face. I start all my interviews by asking my guests, what is she giving? What are you giving? What's, I see you're in a room. I see some lighting. Mm. Is that a denim jacket? What's she giving? No, she's giving you a, it's a, it's a denim, it's a, it's a snap button. Ooh. Because she loves a snap button because it's just easy access. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come right out of the gate, coming in hot. Oop. Okay. Let's pose. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard of it, you know, been around, you know, season three. What's the tea? I need, give me some something, some, something exclusive. <laughs> I need an exclusive, Steven. Well, we've dubbed it season 3.2 <laughs> yeah. to deal with all this, uh, the madness of uh, mm -hmm. Miss Rona just throwing our entire schedule off. For me, season three is all about how do your people, your true ride or dies show up for you when ish hits the fan some of the really exciting more specific things that we're doing this season that i really love we finally get to see miss blanca in a relationship mm. um and so that's really fun and we have cast an incredible tony and emmy nominated actor in jeremy pope who a lot of folks are probably familiar with from hollywood this summer which was a big big hit on Netflix. So uh, Jeremy will be playing her, her boyfriend, Christopher. And so one of the things that we're going to be exploring this season is what does it mean for Blanca to continue to be a mother to her children, but to also want to be a partner? Black and brown women and trans women specifically have always been such a big part in my growth um, as a queer man um, and really understanding what that means outside of myself. So I wanted to ask you, working with our girls like Janet and Lady J and MJ and Angelica, you know, just like what you learn and, and not even in those behind the camera as well, what you learn daily from them and, and like what's changed over the course of your knowing them. The expected answer would be, you know, how to stand in your truth and how to be authentically yourself and, you know, all of the good stuff. But one of the things that's so special about working on Pose is that it's allowed me to meet so many incredible people and to forge new friendships and new bonds and, and dig even deeper. And I think what the show is about at its core is love and family, more specifically chosen family. And that has been, I think, probably one of the greatest gifts coming out of this show. The time that I've spent with all of our producers and our cast and all the incredible, specifically trans identified people on our show has been so incredible and so amazing. And I think what it's done for me is it's really emboldened me to want to be mm -hmm. a more fervent and stronger advocate and ally mm -hmm. to the trans community, because I think it would be easy for me, like you as, a, as another queer cis man, to feel like, well, I'm also disenfranchised because of these identities. And so mm -hmm you know, it's other people's responsibility and job to show up. You know, for me, I feel like, no, I've got to check myself and recognize that I have a lot of privileges. It's the thing that I hope people get if they watch the show, you know, mm -hmm. which is understanding that we're so much more alike than we are different. And I, I would hope that the show would open your heart up and, and force you to, to have empathy. I think you did your first documentary when you were 15. So I wanted to ask you, for the viewers and for myself, um, what was it about filmmaking, cinema, TV that really pushed you to do this, to, to conquer this? I grew up in New York City, which is where I am now. And I grew up 
poor, you know, in housing projects. And this was in the midst of both the crack and AIDS epidemics, which were just eviscerating the LGBTQ plus community and black and brown communities. Film and, and television was a salvation, even more than an outlet, because truth be told, growing up as a kid, I, I never thought that I could create content. You know, I was simply a consumer of content. And part of that is that growing up as a, as a young boy, there were no models. You know, there was no pipeline to go from, you know, the Castle Hill projects to, to Hollywood. And right. so how do you, how do you make a way out of no way? It wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school that I had this opportunity to collaborate with classmates on a documentary short, which was funded by HBO Family, which was a nascent network at the time. And all of a sudden, my world just got rocked because something that I had loved so much, which was you know just being planted in front of a television for hours consuming content, I was now responsible for crafting the content. It just dramatically changed everything. It was after that experience, I said, I wanna be a filmmaker. And here you are. Ooh. And here she is. <laughs> here she is. And it's so funny you say that because I hear so many things about my own upbringing in like seeing sitting in front of the TV and not seeing myself. And then, you know, a John Leguizamo would come on and it'd be like, you'd like hold those things so dear because they're so few mm. and far between. It makes me so happy to hear that and to know that um, we have you uh, creating opportunities for us. You do set out into the world saying, this is who I am and I'm just gonna share whatever I have and whoever's watching, watch. But you didn't know, you don't know who's watching. Um, and that's something I wanted to ask you. What do you say to young Stevens and Johnnies and, you know, Janets and MJs out in this world scared to put their work out because it's not on a big TV show or not, whatnot? What mm. do you say to that child? The first thing that popped to mind is uh, there's a poet, Alex Olson, and in one of her poems, she has a line that I really love um, that I encountered when I was in college, but it, it so deeply resonated with me, which is, my voice is my weapon of choice. And so to that, I say, continue to use your voice in whatever way that you, you choose to use it. You know, so for us, it's, it's for you, it's as an actor and as a performer. For me, it's on the page as a writer, as a storyteller. But in whatever fashion it is, hone your craft, you know, think about who it is that you want to be in the world, mm -hmm. um, you know, have intention and purpose and then continue to work hone that skill and put it out in the world because it really, it matters. One of the things that I love about the conversations that you have a lot of times, even on Twitter, um, you know, a lot of the conversations with Black Lives Matter over the course of the year, um, one thing that always stands out to me is the intersectionality between Latinidad and mm. um, being Black, you know, um, because being Dominican myself, I've grown up around a lot of anti-Black statements from Black people um, that are Dominican, you know? So those conversations, what can you, what do you hope, um, even shows like Pose and the intersections there, what can we learn from that and take it back into our Dominican households, our Puerto Rican households, all of those households mm -hmm. to really advance and get rid of the anti-Blackness within our own Latinx community. For me specifically as a Afro-Puerto Rican, you know, someone who whose mother is, is a Black Puerto Rican, but spent most of my life identifying exclusively as Puerto Rican or Hispanic. And, and so the, the journey of getting to Afro-Puerto Rican and specifically adopting Afro for a very intentional reason, which is the not wanting to erase Mm. our lineage, you know, and, and the rich history of, of our family that is both Puerto Rican and Black, what our audience can take away is the importance of acknowledging identity and also taking a step back to recognize that identity and specifically race and ethnicity is so complex and nuanced and it isn't as simple as just one identifier. You know, we want to put people in a box and it's so much more complicated than that. And this was something I was really vocal about in the summer. You know, if, if you as a Latinx person don't feel moved by the movement for Black lives, mm -hmm. 
then you are in essence not supporting your own community. So I think there's this like othering that happens where it's like, well, that's their issue. That's not my issue. The last point I would make is just to not fall into um, oppression Olympics, Mm. which is look at how bad it is for us. You know, where are the people who are speaking up for our community? We're all rocking in the same boat. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Like all of us are disenfranchised right we all have you know what i mean so it's like sh- let's just all be showing up for each other right let's you know, share the paddle you know, everybody's yeah. rowing together let's <laughs> right. be honest exactly. you know? so i did want to ask you um because queer television is popping right now it um, sure is. <laughs> <laughs> what shows are you watching and binging right now that you're just like obsessed with I mean, I think one of the shows that I w- that I really love, uh, this was earlier in the year, is Sex Education on Netflix. Mm. Like, I love, 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 love that show. And I think, you know, there's a really, this lovely representation of, like, a young Black queer man. Audiences want cultural specificity, right? It's like, mm-hmm. we want niche programming. So there's, like, this stinkiness about, oh, like, nobody wants to watch a story with, like, a bunch of queer people. It's like, actually, they do. Right. <laughs> so if you made it, <laughs> The audience would show up. There people want to see us. <laughs> we want to see us first. Second of all, people will get into it if we, mm-hmm. you know, if we make if you make good stuff, people are gonna watch it. There's this idea in Hollywood that it's like, well, who is this show for? Bitch, it's for everybody. Like, <laughs> who are you talking but about? also, is it so bad to be selfish and be like, it's for me? Exactly. When I wrote that first draft of Pose, I was not thinking about the audience. I really was like, <laughs> you know what? Like, this is what we were told when I was at UCLA. Write the show that you want to watch. So the reality is, like, that very first kernel of an idea was my ass being real selfish and being like, that's a show that I want to watch. Yeah. Period. Can you tell me uh, why you think it's important to cast actors that have a shared life experience as the characters they might be playing? Well, I think there's a deeper trust. And then there's also, and I I know what I'm about to say will speak to you as an actor. There's an interiority to that character's life that I don't have to go into. I don't have to explain it, right? Mm -hmm. In the way that in real life, the majority of the queer and trans people in my life, I have never had a conversation with them about their coming out journey. And it's interesting when I think about that, because the first time that that dawned on me, I thought, well, that makes me a really terrible friend. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like, girl, get out your head, like ask people about themselves. And then I realized like, well, I think part of it is that there's just this unspoken respect and understanding, right? So even for people who maybe I don't particularly care for, if I know that you're part of the LGBTQ plus community, there's always going to be some fraction, some percentage of respect that I'm going to have for that person, because I know how difficult it is to walk through that door, to come out of it and to say, I am going to be authentically me, whatever that looks like for you. Uh 